certainly bless God for each and every one of you here on tonight. I am so excited to be here with each and every one of you. For those of you that are just tuning in, uh, especially those of you that are on YouTube and Instagram, Facebook Live as well, I am Reverend Dr. Nicole B. Simpson. We are on week number seven of our Jesus and Justice Bible study. Now, this Bible study is going to run for three weeks as we deal with civics, really uh, how does scripture and where we are standing in America, how do they line up with each other? And so normally I will tell you who's coming up next as we're dealing with notable figures in the word of God and how they were influenced by the word of God. Um, but because of the state and where we are today, I think it's important for us to recognize our distinction between other cultures, communities, countries, um, or what have you. And then there's just some real necessity for you to, uh, sorry about that, Facebook, for you to know exactly um, how America was originated, not realizing that um, civics has been taken out of our uh, daily learning in school. So uh, this is a perfect opportunity, just from a basics perspective, this is a perfect opportunity to tag, tweet, Text somebody, let them know that we're here. Also, to um, if you know uh, someone that is um, in school, high school, grammar school, college, um, to allow them to um, participate as well. I have my uh, Facebook here open so I can see those of you that are making comments. I'm trying to do a little bit better in terms of engaging with you back and forth overall. So um, just wanted to let you know that. Our scripture text for tonight is going to come out of Exodus, the 18th chapter. We are going to get there. Primary verses are going to be verses number 13 through verse number 27. But I want to, before we get started in how it correlates with scripture, I want to begin by saying how America, America evolved. Because I think uh, if we know how we evolved and what 
the three branches of government are, how they came into existence, where we as minorities fit in, what our theological, um, you know, or, or our biblical responsibilities are, then maybe we will operate better. Perhaps we will take voting more serious. Perhaps uh, we'll recognize our community responsibility that we have our civic engagement. Um, and so uh, just to get started, we oftentimes hear how, um, you know, those from Europe uh, came over to America and stole the land. But uh, that had really uh, nothing to do with the origin of the United States of America. What that does is it shows how uh, those from Europe made it over to America. But it starts off with um, the fact that there was fighting between the 13 colonies and Great Britain. And because of these fightings that was going back and forth before we even get to uh, um, the revolution that had taken place, we find ourselves in this position where uh, all of this calamity and chaos, if America was going to be uh, independent and win the American Revolutionary War that was taking place between Great Britain and America, we needed to operate more as one connective entity. And so while other things had been attempted and they had failed, we find ourselves in this place that, um, you know, that it became necessary for the people to decide their political bands, the individual ideologies and connect with each other so that they could turn around and we find ourselves dealing with the common person that was our oppressors at the time, i.e. which would have been Great Britain. And so, and that happened in 1775. And so we have the Declaration of Independence that was written in 1776. Now, many individuals, I'm just gonna read a small portion. I think it's a portion that many people are already familiar with. But before I get to the part that we always recite, I want you to know that this was the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. So it was the original 13 colonies coming together. And it starts off with the first paragraph, which we oftentimes skip, says when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. Again, putting this in its proper context, the colonies, their enemy wasn't each other. The colonies' enemy or the ones that they had dissension with was Great Britain. We're familiar with this passage that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To, that to secure these rights, here we go, governments are instituted upon men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Let me pause right there. Government is going to be established right, amongst men deriving their just powers from those that they are or the, with the consent of those that are governed. That's how and why we say America is a people's government. We identify, we select leadership to advocate on our behalf. That is the structure the grand design, the great experiment of America. It is clearly expressed when we started off with the Declaration of Independence. Who are we claiming our independence from? Great Britain. And so when you look at that, it says uh, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, here we go, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. 
Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. This is the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. Now that is saying a whole lot even there because in the very beginning, it talks about what the rights of humanity should be. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And so it was inspired to govern this country. There is nowhere in here that it says it's inspired to be a Christian nation. I want you to understand that when this Declaration of Independence was written. It may have been God inspired, like we like to say the word of God. And there have been some people that have gone that far. I'm not going that far, uh, you know, but let's just say that, you know, it was inspired by individuals of faith. It is still not indicative or written in our constitution that this is it. It just talks about merely equality and the rights of the people to determine how they should be governed. It is also in here determining that the people who may or may not be marginalized and oppressed, that if this government is not working for all matters of humanity, changes should not be taken lightly, but there is opportunity for change. And you may say, well, why is that important, Pastor? Because when this was first written, it was white men that wrote this, that had no concern for women and surely did not have any concern for minorities. That means African Americans overall. And so when we look at it from that lens, we have to look at, well, how does this apply to me? And what's my role and or responsibility as a Christian? Now, when I look at what I told you guys to check out, Exodus, we see the formation of a new government. Now, this government is a um, government as being blessed by God. When Moses delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt, we find that when we look at the 18th chapter of Exodus, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes to communicate and bring Moses, his wife, back. He brings Moses, his wife back, his wife, um, which is his wife, Zipporah. Um, he brings his wife back and he wants to fellowship and or engage with Moses. That's what you're going to see in the first few um, verses of this particular passage of scripture. They come along with the two sons, first son named Gershom, who has been an alien in a foreign land. That's what his name means. The second um, son name is um, Eliezer. Eliza, but it's not Elisha, it's Eliezer, for he says that the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of battle. That's the name of Moses' two sons. So here Jethro brings, um, you know, his wife and to um, Moses' wife and their two children back and his spending time with Moses and their fellowshipping. And then Jethro begins to observe. Again, this is the beginning of the first level of government and organization that we can see when one comes out of a place of oppression and or marginalization. That's why I'm using this one in particular. Remember, America was in constant combat with Great Britain. As a matter of fact, it was the American Revolutionary War that was transpiring at the time. America was operating independently according to the 13 colonies, but they realized that they needed to have an organizing government, an organizing body, because they were fractured in their fight against a, big, a, a bigger enemy. I, I, Y'all got that? They were fractured against their fight against a bigger enemy. So Jethro, in his observation, this is what he observes. Verse number 13, I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard Version, Exodus, the 18th chapter. The next day, Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Watch this. Here comes the problem. Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. 
When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses has identified that when people have conflict or issues or challenges, that everybody was bringing the problems to Moses and Moses from sun up to sundown because he has shown himself to be worthy of. Now, if I go and do this correlation between where it is that we were in America, when we look at our founding fathers, because they were fighting and at the forefront of the Revolutionary War, they have shown themselves to be worthy of ones that were advocating for the United States to be in existence when it came to fighting Great Britain. I need y'all to understand that because even though I'm showing correlation, this is not absolute. I want you to be able to envision yourself in the text and see how it's relative to us, right? So Moses' father-in-law, verse number 17 says, what you are doing is not good. Your methodology is off. The way that you're trying to work this out, it's not gonna work this way. There's going to be a problem eventually. You may not see it now, but there's going to be a problem eventually. Does that sound like America right there? So when we look at where we were in 1776, uh, it clearly was a problem. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. America realized each particular colony could not fight Great Britain alone. And that's when America realized we're stronger together and we could not um, you know, impose levies, taxes, anything of that nature, couldn't get the economic resources. So here it is, let me use COVID-19 as an example. One state, New York City, could finally be winning in the battle against COVID-19, while another state, South Dakota, you know, because they're not operating according to the same rules and regulations, they're losing. And eventually, because somebody, one person in South Dakota could come back to New York City, and then everybody is in a lose-lose proposition. A fractured strategy for a collective group of people well, over time, the flaws in that system will reveal itself. We have that in our own lives, in our own walks, in our own journey. You see that in church in the 21st century. You see that in regular organizations. We see that in the infancy of America before we became the United States of America because we weren't the United States of America. We were 13 colonies existing until they began to say how important it is to work together. Now, I want you to also understand that when you look at America, that's why there's a significant emphasis on state rights because each state was operating as its own independent entity before the federal government became like the umbrella over the states. And we still to this day will see conflict between the federal government and the state. Here it is. Jethro says, there's going to be a problem in the way it is that you're designing this. There's going to be a problem in how you're trying to manage this. This is not going to be effective for you, for you to surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. The task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. You're going to need help. This is the reason why America doesn't have a king. In our declaration, we were very clear that we wanted influence as the people to tell those uh, that we have appointed to advocate on our behalf. Jethro says, now listen to me, I'll give you counsel and God be with you. You should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. Here's verse number 21 that is important. It's not that we could not come together, Moses being influential and saying, teach them what God has taught you. Show them the way, show them who it is and that we are. I need you to do that in the very beginning, but then I'm going to need you as your counselor, look for able men among the people, people who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officials or officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, 
and tens. I love this particular uh, I, um, establishment of organization because it starts off from a major level and it works itself all the way down. And that's really what America has had the opportunity to do. We have federal, state, and local government entities that have been established. But here it is, before we even get to anything, we've got to see how we were originally organized. Now, even though the Declaration of Independence, and I suggest that you read it for yourselves. When the Declaration of Independence was originally established, they write out all of the reasons why they're declaring their independence from Great Britain. They talk about really the inarchical nature of the king, how he was not one to regard what he refused to do for the people, how he um, did not allow his governors to pass laws that were being um, oppressing and immediate importance. I wish somebody would understand where I'm going with this on today, because don't this sound uh, uh, familiar? Let me just read it. I, like I told y'all, y'all, you, you should read it for yourself. But this is the history between Great Britain and what they were dealing with in America and the problem that America had with Great Britain at the time, which caused for the secession in the first place or America to declare their independence. He has a, refused his asset to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. Now, I'm not saying I know somebody, but I know somebody who looks like they want to be the king over America. So this sounds familiar to me. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in the operation till his assent should be obtained. Like he has to have hand or rule over everything. Uh, it doesn't matter what the laws say. If he's not going to ordain it, co-sign it, or what have you, it cannot um, manifest itself. You want a perfect example? Everything that's going on with TikTok right now versus Oracle and Walmart, that is not generally something that the president of the United States would get involved in. But if you are a king or in a tyrannical entity or a government that does that, then the government has influence over everything that's done, even when it comes to something that's corporate America. I wish y'all catch that. I need y'all to understand the parallel of what it is that I'm talking about. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of, of people. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that one again. This is our Declaration of Independence, for those of you that don't know. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people will relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a, light, a right intestamentable to them and formidable to tyrants only. This is what our Declaration of Independence says. This is what we succeeded from Great Britain for. This is exactly what America is trying to go back to now, uh, indirectly with the administration that they have. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just saying, look at what we declared ourselves to be free from and observe what is going on in this country right now to recognize uh, that the very thing that we shot away from, it is as if we're running into um, it again with open arms. But here we have one king that we ran away from, did not want to have for America. We have the attributes or the commonalities of what it is that we see in this administration now. This, if none of the other ones touched you at the core of who it is that you are, you should recognize the refusal to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, meaning the masses work, the masses are the ones that should be able to do what? Go back to the first, the second paragraph of the Constitution. What did we say that we wanted them to do? We wanted people with the consent of the governor to pick out people that are going to advocate and or or be the representative of those of us that are being governed. So for those of you that are irresponsible and don't vote and you're trying to figure out what's the importance or the necessity of voting, here it is, the people, those that are being governed are supposed to pick representatives that are advocating on their own behalf so that they can have a representation when it comes to ruling large governs or bodies of people. There's got to be a consensus of what is transpiring so that the rule of law is applicable across the board. It is also so inspired that it says, uh, 
whimsical or flimsy, and I'm paraphrasing, well, I'm not even paraphrasing, I'm surmising for you, a flimsy and whimsical, a whimsical uh, flow by night or, you know, issues of the day are not a substantive enough reason to change what has already been established. Now, how, Dr. Simpson, are you correlating this in America with Moses? Well, so here's the thing. Moses knew what God said. In the organizing body, Moses had the blueprint as inspired by God that he needed to teach the people and so that the people would know what God was asking for. The people then would be able to go to other individuals, not just Moses. So what's happening right off the bat is uh, that the very ability to look at one party when we start putting all of that power in the hands of one party even when jethro and he wasn't necessarily doing it it doesn't say in the text or not when he said moses you need to really divest responsibility you need to hand out responsibility he wasn't doing it from a perspective that um you know he was concerned about moses being a tyrant or moses being too powerful or too much of an authoritarian he was doing it for the welfare of moses recognizing you can't do this every day all day the weight of the issues that people are going to have is going to be too great you need some level of infrastructure oh can i i'm gonna get myself in trouble but can i go here for a moment let me just go here for a moment because why not pastor just, you know you got the space and time and opportunity this is where the church comes in anytime you have and generally it's patriarchal in nature whenever it is that you have this pastor who is so dominating and ruling that whatever pastor says goes and there's no one that um is filled with the holy spirit knows the lord as well that can really have dialogue or conversation with the pastor then what are you designing what are you designing i'm just gonna pause that right there because i don't want no trouble i don't want no problem with nobody or what have you uh but but churches should not be tyrannical in nature it shouldn't be where it is so heavily emphasized in one entity because even the new um the bible tells us in the new testament you know really in terms of roles and responsibilities you shall have many pastors i don't, I don't want to get in trouble with nobody i appreciate all of y'all that allow me to shepherd y'all but we do have to be very careful that you only can hear from one voice that really you know um will be able to be the only one that can feed your spirit that's not how the word goes that's not how it all happens you know so um you know there can be multiple pastors in a congregation or in the church, you might have a senior pastor, you know, in terms of the level of influence, but we've got to be extraordinarily careful. So here's the thing. The reason why, and a part of the, uh, the um, uh, Declaration of Independence, I almost forgot what I was talking about, Declaration of Independence, the other reason why that they give and they write this out, it says he's called together legislative bodies. Um, he has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, dis um, distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measure. <laughs> Woo! Anybody else feel that way that everything that has been going on, uh, we have just really pressured and, uh, you know, taxed our other existing bodies. So let me just say this, you're going to hear this a couple of times over the next three weeks. We have three branches of government. We have the legislative, the executive, the judicial. The legislative branch, Congress, was formed first. Congress was designed, House of Representatives and the Senate. And we're going to get into that more on next week, but I'm going to give you the basics of it, um, you know, overall. The king of Great Britain or Great Britain dissolves representative houses repeatedly because they disagreed with him. And so here it is that that's originally what the Declaration of Independence was when they began to come together, realizing that they needed some sort of um, some sort of governing body so that the United States could begin to work together. It took them, um, you know, I, I believe from uh, 1773 uh, and it being ratified in 1781. It was originally the Declaration of Independence was written first before we get what we deem to be our constitution, we had the Articles of Confederation that were written. That's really what brought us all together. The Articles of Confederation. It is where the individual states 
you know, began to identify what they're willing to give up in their individual powers and be fully represented of in there on the federal scale or, you know, so that everybody would not be trying to cut a deal, create a treaties with Great Britain themselves. It gave them the ability to work together collectively, cohesively. The House of Representatives, um, you know, being um, Congress and a House, um, a House of Representatives and Congress, um, I'm sorry, Senate and House of Representatives um, overall. It took, in order for all 13 states at the time to be on board, it was not originally the Constitution, it was the Articles of Confederation. So first you have the Declaration of Independence, and that happened in 1776, it was written, they were working off of the framework of the Articles of Confederation, which was originally started off in 1773, <coughs> excuse me, but fully ratified in 1781. Because they were able to do that, the American Revolutionary War officially ended in 1783. Now, I want to go through the Articles of Confederation for a moment because it created a confederation, the government of the loosely organized independent states. Let me give my sister a plug here for a moment. If you have not recognized her, it's a battle.com blog. She's been blogging again. She took the month of August off and then after Labor Day came back. <clears throat> and on this um, on this week in particular, she began to talk about being, you know, on the same team being on the same team. There's a point that I want to make because even though we have the three independent, wholly responsible branches of government, the one thing that we've got to identify, even though we have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. So the executive, um, you know, or, or the legislative create the laws, the um, executive executes the laws, the judicial interprets the laws. I'm going to give you more of a comprehensive again next week in that regard. But even though there are three independent quote, co-equal branches of government. Here's the thing that we have to understand. In order for America to be amazing as we are, we are still interdependent. Now, even though we have these independent responsibilities, wholly responsible for our fair share of roles and responsibilities, we are still, to be the United States of America, we are still interdependent. Meaning, for us to be the best at who it is that we are, for us to be the best and who it is that we are, we still must work together, all right? So the Articles of Confederation created the Confederation, a government of loosely organized independent states. The national government under the Articles of Confederation consisted of one single legislative body. It was still called the Congress of the United States. That national government had limited powers under the Articles of Confederation. For example, this particular um, government at the time could not levy taxes or regulate commerce. That was still responsibilities of the state. Additionally, there was not an executive or judicial branch of government under the articles. There were problems because uh, the federal government did not have enough authority. Let me go back here for a moment and talk about what Jeffro was saying, the balance and the responsibilities. Um, and the reason why Moses needs to do such things he says, if you pick out men who are fear God, who are trustworthy, hate dishonest gain, set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but let them decide every minor case amongst themselves so that it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this and God commands you, then you will be able to endure and all the people will go to their home in peace. This is very important because when they set up organizationally, there had to be a level of trust in not only those that have been selected as God-fearing individuals, but there had to be a buy-in from the people there had to be a buy-in from Moses, who was getting his buy-in from God. And there had to be an understanding that the representatives recognize not only the position of influence and authority that they would be in, entrusted with, but recognize that there was someone else watching over them. At that time, that would have been Moses as God's representative. This is the organization of you know, the children of Israel 
first organization that we can see that included dissipation of power and authority to advocate on, for the greater good of a larger body. I think in its essence, America's design, the grand design is brilliant by design. For those of us that love the word of God, and we believe that all scripture is God inspired, all scripture is written by the inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, rebuke, um, for um, teaching correction and rebuke, we understand that um, God inspired individuals to write such a perfect mechanism for us to have right relationship with him. When I look at <clears throat> how our constitution has been designed, I'm telling you, I think it was written brilliantly, but it is for humanity on earth, not spiritual. But in terms of it just being influenced and it's divinely inspired, I, and divinely inspired, I think you can see some tenets of that for the governing body here on earth. Because no matter how you dissect it, no matter how, you, how much you look at it, you see that all people are included. Whether humanity decided they were going to extract or not intend to include women and or minorities in the writings or the grand design of a thing, it has been identified as a brilliant document and governing mechanism for us in society today. We mess it up. And so the Articles of Confederation was flawed, much like we are today. It's not that you if it was perfect for its time or was good for its time, but problems emerge over time. And we need to always have the flexibility, the ability, the opportunity to go back and revisit that which had been originally established. We have done that on numerous occasions uh, with the Constitution. But I want you to know before we got to the Constitution, it was because it was written again because the Articles of Confederation showed the flaws that were designed. And we know that we see the flaw in Moses' original methodology of how to engage or deal with a large body of people. That was a flaw. That's what Jethro picked out. It is what he identified. The first, the first organizing body required of him to teach, right? Moses to teach and then for him to identify those that would be facilitators of that which had been taught. They would be facilitators of that which had been taught. So everybody's on the same page. We now know the minor issues going to them and the major issues working its way back up to Moses. The Articles of Confederation didn't have enough power because they didn't have enough power because individual states still wanted, the 13 individual states still wanted their level of um, notoriety, independence, and their own individual power, states were printing their own money in violation of that particular national law, and states were conducting foreign trade negotiations in violation of that natural own law, and states were organizing their own armed forces. We see that now, even in where we're standing now, we see that our all of our states, we got states, we got local, we got um, troopers, in our um, country now. So I'm not sure how much more efficient we've become overall, but it was problematic at best. The armed forces that was identified was um, you know, what states were doing at the time. Congress <clears throat> recognized that we needed to give more power to federal authority, that states were going to have to cede some of its authority because again, as much as they were trying to come together and identify flaws, they were still, I mean, or identify that they needed to confront Great Britain, they were going to have trouble amongst themselves if they were to continue to go along the pathway or the route that they were going along. These events led to a meeting in 1787. And that meeting, for those of us that don't know, it became the Constitutional Convention. Now, this is where the Constitution was established. So look at all that has happened beforehand. That's why I had to break this up because I couldn't get to the three branches of government without giving you pure foundation. And I figured if I'm going to do it, we need to do this right. 1787 meeting, 12 of the 13 states, they sent delegates to Philadelphia 
in order to form the new constitution. The Articles of Confederation served as a written document that established the functions of the national government in the United States after it declared its independence from Great Britain, but it established a weak central government that mostly but not entirely prevented the individual states from, uh, from doing their own foreign diplomacy. And so that's where there was problems because, you know, in as much as it met the need, it did, it met the need of dealing with and engaging with Great Britain, it did not meet the need of sustainability amongst themselves. Now, this had been tried beforehand. I should just probably throw this out there just in case somebody is a history buff and they really want to know. There were other ones and attempts that were made like the Albany plan, which would represent Albany, New York. But again, it was not given enough power and authority to the federal government in order to, um, you know, to, to really take away the power and authority that Britain had had. And so in order for um, America to really truly be independent, there had to be a clean and clear break from Great Britain, where America would stand on its own. And so even though there was a whole bunch of issues and there was some challenges amongst one another, what we know is that the U.S. Constitution in 1789 was the very thing that replaced the Articles of Confederation. I'm not going to get into the U.S. Constitution tonight because I think that that will be, um, you know, where it is that we need to start on next week. But I do want us to see that this is how and why we got to where it is. Now, it's with the U.S. Constitution that there are some basics that I do want to share with us that becomes important, much like when we look at <clears throat> where it is we are here with um, the organization and the structure of what Moses did at the advice of Jethro, the organ and body was beginning to formulate, right? Something was beginning to happen. Structure, the grand design was beginning to take place to do what? Alleviate pressure to also take advantage of or not take advantage of overwhelming or taxing any one entity or individuals. I also want you to see how problematic it was when you do declare and devise kings. Now, a little later on, we're going to recognize, and let me just kind of put this out here, why kings are problematic. When God designed, um, you know, what, let, me, let me not say this. Yeah, no, no I, I think it's, it's fair for me to say. When God selected, not designed, when God selected the children of Israel, right? This is where we see this. When he takes them out of Egypt and he has this conversation, he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. He never designed you know, and desired for the people to have a king to rule over them. He never desired. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And here it is that there was something that was being structured and organized and the people were murmuring and complaining. How do we know this? We know because other cultures and communities and the people that were around the children of Israel, although they were being well provided for, although they were favored in the land, although America has all of these opportunities, a great opportunity to acquire and accumulate wealth, there was still something to complain about. The children of Israel still had something to complain about. They complained because all of the nations had kings. They didn't have a king. They didn't need a king because they had God. Do you know how insulting it was for the people, the children of Israel to have to go to God and say, we want a king. I mean, come on. Here God had already established something. Moses, we know that was called by God. That would be Saul and David, y'all. I don't want anybody to think I'm saying that, you know, I jumped from Moses to them. I'm, I'm just hoping that y'all know y'all Bible, but someone just told me to rear back and just make that transition more smoothly so that I won't lose anybody. So let me make it a little more smoothly. When God created the original design with Moses and Jethro through the advice and the counsel tells Moses, this is how we can manage this. God was still in charge. He was still the go-to because Moses was God's representative, God's voice. And so Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he said. 
Moses, verse number 25, chose able men from all Israel and pointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tons. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart and he went off to his own country. There was something that had been established. It was a working mechanism. The working mechanism was because the individuals that had been chosen were God-fearing individuals, but God was still ruler over the children of Israel. I'm not saying that God wasn't the ruler when they asked for a king, but understand, they felt like they needed somebody tangible, physical, or what have you. Moses never said that he ruled the people. He was the epitome, the embodiment, the everything that we always want to identify. He was it when it comes to servant leader. As he was giving his instructions to God and giving it to the people. There are some of us that say, there are some of us that say that America's writing of the Constitution was God inspired. Well, if it was, America has shown itself to be as hard headed as the children of Israel because the design and the model of the Declaration of Independence was a model that was equalizing for all of us so that we would have what? life, liberty, and the pursuit of happening, happiness. That to secure them, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. If we want to see ourselves saying that our constitution is our, listen, don't, don't, don't stone me. I'm not, I'm not equating it to the Bible. But if our constitution is America's holy writ, I'm getting all like, or whatever. Yeah. Then we can see how perfect of an entity it is where it is covering us as an organizing structure that protects everybody. It is those that are in power that abuse that level of power that got us into the position of the place that we're in even right now. So America realizes that this is problematic, but if we would have stuck to what it is that God originally designed, you know, um, we would be in a much better place. The children of Israel show us all of the flaws that are going to go on for the next three weeks. They show us where all of the challenges are. Now, you're starting off with a beautiful foundation because at first it began to work. As we expand, as we increase, as we mature, as we get smarter, you know, we realize, um, you know, <clears throat> that in all of that, you know, things change, situations change. We've got to grow. We've got to, you know, we've got to do those things. Sometimes we do it right. Sometimes we don't get it all the way right. And that's what you see here. Moses started or instituted the whole aspect of appointing judges, people of wise counsel, to be able to meet the needs of people who, um, you know, quite honestly, um, had some level of maturity, spiritual, um, spiritual depth, you know, um, wise counsel amongst themselves. So it wouldn't have been anybody young. Let me take a stab at this real fast. It wouldn't have been anybody young. So right now on our Supreme Court, we find that um, the administration has been stacking the court with young people. See, those are not the individuals that according to the way that we were doing this um, then or the way that Moses was given the charge to do it, he wasn't picking the youngest person that can do it so that they can have a lifetime appointment. He was picking people that were wise and of sound counsel. As a matter of fact, when we look at bishops, I don't understand how you can be a 21-year-old bishop. I don't know. I, don't, I, I mean, I don't, I don't understand that because you ain't been through nothing yet. You ain't been through nothing. How can you be a bishop if you ain't been through nothing? You ain't got no, no, no wisdom. You ain't got no sound judgment. You not Solomon. That's not who you are. You know, but that's, you know, maybe that's just my rant for a day. But when God creates a mechanism, it is enough. And when he tells us to expand it, we can. I think when we look at the word of God, the children of Israel made the same mistakes that America makes and continues to make today. The children of Israel showed us what not to do because they did it and we're still doing it and putting ourselves in a position, a precarious position. So here it is. 
I'm appreciative of what Moses, um, what Jephthah oh, provides to Moses. He provides structure in a way to establish and create organizing body. But I do know, and if you know your word, we do know that as other countries, um, I'm saying other countries, as other communities then, other territories then, and they were countries. I mean, even back then, as other countries or um, kings, um, you know, communities with kings, as the children of Israel were ind independent, they were always fighting. They had to fight. They were always fighting, you know, for, for territory, space, and land. So there's nothing that has changed to how America, when they first established, how we, you know, received our land as well. But, um, when this begins to happen, because Moses did not have, or because the children of Israel did not have a king, over time, the people began to murmur and complain because they saw that the Malachites, the Amalekites, and all of them, they had kings. And so you see the dissension and the rumbling that comes up, which at that period of time, here's my transition to my clothes, y'all. At that period of time, the children of Israel, over time, they begin to rumble and they go and they say, we want a king. We want a king. Now, at that time, it was priest because, again, God was in control. God was in control. And because God was in control, you know, um, he would use priests because more organizing did transpire. And we'll get into that next week as we correlate that, how this is the initial, how did we get to the three branches of government? Because the first one was Congress. I want you to see that today. We are going to split off into 12 territories in the word of God. And so America splits off into three equal government bodies. I know I said this, right? Because I want y'all to get it. Legislative, executive, judicial. So we're going to see the breaking off of that in America of what happened and what their roles and responsibilities were. And even in the word of God, there is a branching off and there's still dissension amongst the ranks. And everybody still wants a king, not God. For those of you that like to, you know, know a little bit more, here's the fortes. Samuel is the one. The people come up to Samuel, we want a king like they have a king. We'll get into depth more about it next week. Samuel takes this petition to God. God is angry. Samuel is angry that the people would even have the audacity to ask. God is like, yeah, no, they're rejecting me, not rejecting you. And so we're going to get into that next week. So here it is. I want y'all to understand. And when we first got started, there's something brilliant, something masterful in organization. But there was also something that is rooted and grounded or should have always been rooted and grounded in moral integrity. When the Declaration of Independence was written, when we were fighting against Great Britain, it was inclusive of all. And I think the foundation and the structure of the um, Declaration of Independence that caused us to write the Articles of Confederation that will ultimately get us to the um, U.S. Constitution, all of those things were inspired, inspired divinely and all inclusive of us. And that's the part that I want you to capture tonight, that we all have a hand in democracy. We all have a hand in what is to transpire in these United States of America. I love you to life. I pray that you learned something about really the organizing entity. We'll get more into it on next week when we separate the three branches of government. But in order to understand where we are today, you want to, I, I thought it was important to lay the groundwork if we're going to teach it. I wanted to make sure you had all of it, not just selectively because that's the problem with our history now. Because when I get into it, I want to go, how did Congress, how did it establish? And next week we will get into how were African-Americans identified as three-fifths of an individual? How did they all come together to write the U.S. Constitution? What power did the, um, did the South have? you know, where they decided they were going to hold out until they got that level of representation, which is why the Congress has less people than the Senate, you know, because they're like, well, we want our people to be counted, but we don't want to give Black people full share. How did the Electoral College map come into existence in the first place? Because it's not fully representative of all the people. So if you don't know this, that may not be easy to absorb and understand. I want to make sure 
that we would not be ignorant. I love you to life. I thank God for each and every one of you. Um, listen, before I go into prayer, tomorrow morning, prayer, 7 a.m., we're going to continue with Lamentations. I, I don't know where we're at. I think we're on verse 15 um, and moving forward of the third chapter of Lamentations. This Sunday morning, we're back virtual worship services. This Sunday also is communion. So I think I gave or I tried to give all of the families Communion cups to last us throughout the winter. If you don't have any and you need pastor to get you some, let me know or prepare something to um, drink, a little fruit juice or grape juice or what have you, and a piece of bread or a cracker or something of that nature. I did try to give out as much cups as I possibly can. All right. So I want to make sure that you are all conscious and all aware of that. Um, that that will be taking place Sunday morning worship, 9.45 a.m. And uh, Micah family, our anniversary is next month, five months. I talked to the leadership department, five years, October 18th, sorry. Five years, Micah would have been in existence October 18th, the third Sunday in October. So I'm asking all of you, I'm asking all of you, please Friday night, October 16th, let us come together as a family. We are not going to do in the age of COVID-19, we're not going to do the whole anniversary or whatever. We are going to postpone our celebration. And when we gather together to celebrate, we're going to have a good time. OK, but I do want to point out that as a family, I would like to on that Friday night us to gather together intimately, not in person. But we do want to acknowledge that. Um, it's a blessing to be able to say that we've been in existence for five years. So I want to put that out there to everyone. I want to talk to the leadership team before presenting it to you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. We thank you. We love you. We bless you. We are grateful to know that, oh God, you have blessed us at Micah 7 Ministries. In this age of dissension where America is at a place or a turning point, a reckoning, if you will, you have given... Oh God, us as the body of Christ, the word of God to go to so that we know how to dispel disputes. But you've also blessed America with a governing body, a creed, a, oh God, a principle to live by. And I pray, Lord God, that we understand even, oh God, your level of influence in that. And that we still have a responsibility to be trustworthy, honorable, and of good moral character, things that we should do and know and be just because we belong to you. And if we're going to fully represent your, who you are and what it is you have called for us to do in this confused place and space called America, we must first know who we are and what we stand on. And Lord God, I know your scripture it says, you judge the people, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is within me. That is not just for the Reverend Dr. Lord God. It is in your word of God that all of us, Lord God, should be cognizant of who it is that we're representing and who it is that judges us. So that when we come looking for, as a collective body willing to be governed, even in the country, honoring and adhering to the rules of law, that they are reflective of the lost mass bodies of people. Let us get our own creed right because it does not conflict with your word. Father, I pray, Lord God, that we're reflective upon this and understand who it is that we are, what it is that we bring to the table and how it is, oh God, uh, we are to engage in our interdependency upon each other. This is your humble servant's prayer acting us, asking you tonight to let us all reflect upon how we can be better contributors, better neighbors, better friends to one another. And this and in all things, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I thank God for each and every one of you. I pray that you learn something tonight, amen, and that you see you know, where we can see ourselves in scripture, because that's my whole reason for doing all of this. I love you to life. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. I will see you tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. in prayer.